Thank you for being here tonight. Um, obviously, it's a, a little bit of a smaller crowd, so I will not be using the microphone, but I do want to start off with some uh, introductions. My name is um, Carrie Wozniak, and I'm the superintendent here at Fraser Public Schools, and uh, I've been here now 13 years, six years as your superintendent, and we all know what a wonderful community Fraser um, is, and we're grateful for our families, our, our staff members, they do a wonderful job, and our school board members are also here tonight. I have three of them here, and I want to start with them first. I've got um, Dr. Kathleen Boko, if you can stand up or wave. Thank you. Um, we have our chair. Yeah, you are on here, I swear. That's fine. No, 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 no. <laughs> I have there you see yeah, it. Just refresh. There you go. <laughs> I can't not have him on here. <laughs> and Mr. Dan Swinski, our, our board secretary, if you could give a quick wave. And then our board president, Mr. Scott Wallace, they're here tonight as well to support us in this conversation. Hey. And then I also have Mr. Dan Waters, our assistant superintendent of safety operations and transportation. And you'll be hearing quite a bit um, from him tonight. He's done a wonderful job of really um, keeping all of our operations and safety protocols um, in place and moving forward. I also have Mr. Kyle Ray, our Director of Secondary Education here tonight, um, Ms. Jane Sturgill, our Director of Special Education, who quarterbacks all of our threat assessment, suicide prevention work, um, all of our kind of, um, the crisis management work that we do in the district. And then last but certainly not least, Ms. Kristen Summer, who is in the back, and she will be taking care of um, the question and answer portion of the evening. So just to give you a quick overview of what's gonna to happen tonight, um, we're gonna take some time to look at these five topics that we often get questions about. The first one really is the importance of prevention. And that's key, you don't want to be in a position where you have to you know, deal with the crisis. So we're gonna talk specifically about how we handle threats in the building our threat assessment protocol. We have a very tight system on how we assess when a threat is made. Um, Dan is going to be talking tonight about all of the security updates that we've made throughout our district, kind of where we've been and where we're going. And then we're going to also talk about the preparation we've taken with our buildings and staff. And then what do we actually do when there's an incident and when something occurs in a building. And then we'll close out with questions and answers tonight. So that's a little bit of a roadmap of where we're headed. And before I um, turn it over to um, Ms. Jane Sturgill, I think there are two things to remember. Obviously, safety is a top priority, and, and we do a very good job, I think, of you know keeping and, and making sure that the right people are coming into our building. But there are really two important things um, to remember, and that is the importance of prevention and being tight with your protocols and making sure when you do have people entering the building, you know, we're checking IDs, and that can be frustrating. Also making sure that we assess all of the threats. Even when they seem like, oh, you know, why are they going through this whole process? This seems like a really big deal, but we take all threats very seriously. So prevention is really priority one. The more things you can do on the front end, um, you know, the better off you're gonna be. And also, creating a culture of safety and belonging. When our students feel safe and feel like they belong in their school, they're gonna make better choices. They're gonna be proud of their school and they're gonna want to be um, very mindful of the decisions you're making. So that's what um, Ms. Sturgill's gonna be talking about in a moment. And then Dan Waters is really gonna take some time to talk about what we actually do when a situation occurs or when we have to take action and um, what those measures will like. So I think that's going to give you a really nice overview because sometimes your kid might, your child might come home and say, you know, this happened today. And you're like, well, what did the school do? What's the process that they use? So our goal tonight is to really make sure you know what our administrators are doing and what we're doing um, as a teaching staff to make sure that we're addressing concerns and we're being um, proactive with, with our work. So on that note, I'm going to turn it over here to um, Ms. Sturgill, who is our Director of Special Education, who's going to be talking about the importance of um, creating a culture of okay. Thank you. Dr. Wozniak. Good evening, everybody. So as um, Dr. Wozniak mentioned, my name is Jane Sturgill. I am the Director of Special Education here in Frazier. Um, but I also, in my former life, before I was an administrator, I've been a school psychologist for the last 20 years. So I kind of have an interesting perspective about some of these things. Um, I'm also a trainer of the third um, edition of the Prepare School Safety and Crisis Prevention Intervention Model, 
So you can Google it later if you want, um, but as a district, we're very familiar with some best practices when it comes to school safety and crisis prevention, and then also our intervention for our students. But to begin with, I'm gonna talk, of, as Dr. Wozniak mentioned, about the creating a culture of belonging in our schools. So we know, as, as Dr. Wozniak alluded to, that there's substantial research around connectedness to the school and the community, and what we call protective or resiliency factors. Um, the data is really clear. When we can look at reducing the prevalence rates it, of, of of, uh, delinquent behavior that leads to higher academic performance and outcomes like GPA, engagement and motivation, um, having a more positive perception of our schools and the climate and connectedness towards adults, both in the school and in their families. Um, we really strive here in Fraser to cultivate those supportive relationships from our staff, whether that's a teacher or a coach or a paraprofessional, social worker, psychologist, counselor, um, and we have all kinds of different things that we do to engage students both in and out of the classroom, from our athletics departments and performing arts to our CTE programs, um, all the different community service projects our students are involved in, clubs, um, all of those kinds of things. And it's, this is important for a few different reasons. Specifically, um, kids that are feeling connected to their school and their community are going to take more pride in their school, therefore they're less likely to deface property, they're more likely to treat others in the environment with respect, they're more likely to seek help for themselves or a friend that they may see they need, and they're also less likely to harm themselves or others. So this is just, schools are just one piece of this culture of belonging that we have in our community. Families, adults in our community, any stakeholder um, is just as important. So we as adults can model for our students and the kids in our lives on a daily basis those promote and promote resiliency factors like um, adaptive and healthy coping mechanisms, things like that. And our, of course, our staff all spend time nurturing our kids. They're being present, and visible, approachable, creating all those opportunities for positive reactions with our students. And again, same within the community and in the home. So all adults in a student's life are important from that perspective. We do have a number of different programs that we utilize here in Fraser on a proactive side of things, um, as well as intervention that we provide to our students from preschool all the way up through 12th grade. So one thing in some terms you may have heard before, we have school-wide positive behavior supports in all of our buildings, preschool all the way up through high school. I'm very proud of that. We're one of few schools in the county that have all levels covered from that perspective. Restorative practices is something we utilize in all of our, our buildings. We have a number of research-based curriculums and programs like Second Step, our Be Nice program at the secondary level. It's all about reducing the stigma surrounding mental health and promoting that resiliency that I mentioned. Um, we have the utilization of, of various trauma-informed practices, and we have school-based mental health professionals in every single building, which is a huge point of pride for me as a, as a psychologist. Um, we have school counselors, school social workers, school psychologists in, at all the levels um, that really can take the time to connect with students, but also help families for our students that might need additional resources within the community. So we have long-standing contracts with outside agencies like CARE of Southeastern Macomb, um, partnerships with Macomb County Community Mental Health, et cetera, again, to provide those wraparound type services that our students might need um, after the school day ends. Again, all of those things work together to enhance the, the capacity of our entire educational system from a universal level to something more targeted for a few students or more intensive um, level for some of our students that may require the additional help. So I'm going to shift gears and talk about threat assessment. So what is threat assessment? Threat assessment was initially developed by the Secret Service, um, and it's a process simply of evaluating a threat that comes to our attention. Obviously, it's been modified for what we do in a school setting. Um, we're not doing the same protocols that our law enforcement use. However, um, it's definitely in line with what is considered best practice for youth and other students. Um, one important thing I think is really important for everyone to take away from tonight is that youth, and sometimes adults, um, make threats that are not serious. Um, and maybe just kind of a fleeting or transient kind of comment, right? So anybody guilty of threatening a spouse at home maybe, right? So you can make a threat but not pose a threat. And that's a distinction that we make um, every time we get a, 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 an assessment that we have to do in terms of screening a threat. But also the aggressive behaviors can range from horse play that gets out of hand to something that's more serious like assault. Um, and it's, it's our obligation in a school, um, and all of our educators, um, and all staff in our schools, that we have this commitment to educate our young 
people, regardless of the difficulties that they may have. All students are, are part of our community. Um, we do have a very specific problem solving approach that we use. There's two goals. One is safety for all, for everyone, staff and students alike, and the community as a whole, as well as helping kids be as successful as possible in school and, and hoping that they become contributing members of society as they get, as they get bigger. Um, <clears throat> there are lots of evidence-based systems you can use for threat assessment. Um, here in Fraser, and every district is tasked with picking the one that's best for their organization. Here in Fraser, we've adopted a model that the Michigan State Police um, recommend. It's called the Michigan K-12 Behavioral Threat Assessment and Management, um, or BTAM for short. Um, a lot of other public schools, and not just the county, but the entire state have adopted this model as well. Um, so essentially, our model is to identify any things of concern, engage the students and community and family when we need to, and then work collaboratively, collaboratively with families and students to mitigate any situational variables or factors that are contributing to that student's difficulty. Our process. Um, so this is a, a protocol that we follow, as, as Dr. Wozniak mentioned, it's very tight, it's fact-based and productive. It's a comprehensive, multidisciplinary, multi-tiered, multi-agency and dynamic approach. So what I mean by that when I say uh, multidisciplinary, there's multiple different people and backgrounds that are a part of that team that are trained to do these assessments. Uh, multi-tiered, so again, some are more serious than others. Multi-agency, we partner with community agencies and law enforcement. And dynamic meaning it can change as it goes. Additional information might come to light and we need to address those things kind of as we go. So it's not static in that way. And we use this approach anytime staff or students report a possible threat. This could be a comment made on the playground at recess that a student was bothered by. It could be something the student draws in school or something they write on an assignment or a test. Um, a report from a teacher, any community agency, um, member could, could also report threats. It's not you know, reserved just to staff and students. Um, when we get a, a, a referral, I guess you would call it, um, we receive that and screen it. From there, we gather additional information that might be needed to try to determine if it's just kind of a, a more substantial threat or something that's more transient. And then we um, identify different levels of attention based on that information. So we, we involve law enforcement if we need to escalate to that. We involve other community agencies, again, when needed as well. So we do have trained professionals in all of our buildings. Um, our approach requires a school-based mental health professional to be involved in every screening and every full assessment, as well as an administrator. And then when we do a full assessment, we always have at least one more person involved. And that might be a school resource officer, it might be another administrator, myself, it might be um, school resource officer, law enforcement, those kinds of things, okay? Um, and the last thing I want to leave with before we move on to some of the physical safety aspects of our district, um, research really does suggest that students or um, school shooters don't just snap, okay? There are some very specific behaviors that can be observed um, and that we can intervene early and prevent those things from happening. So we can, um, you know, intervene early is, is, a, is a really good thing. So it's also important to recognize that there isn't a profile. There are risk factors that we can identify um, that would lead a student to be on the pathway to violence, but there's not a specific profile of a student. Um, and again, that means that we have the ability to intervene and to prevent any potential harm to their greatest extent possible. That's exactly what we aim to do. So as I mentioned, you can make a threat but not pose a threat. Um, and, and certainly we take that into account when we do these assessments. And sometimes a student might be threatening to self themselves, but also to others. So we also do, as Dr. Wozniak mentioned earlier, some suicide risk assessments when we need to, and to assess that vulnerability. So again, threat assessment is just one small component of the work we're doing that's much more comprehensive approach to maintaining a safe school. Um, and we try to balance that psychological safety and the connectedness with physical safety. So with that, I will turn it over to, Dr. Uh, to Mr. Waters for Not some additional updates. Not yet. Not yet. Thank you, uh, Hello, everyone. Good to see everyone. Um, thank you for taking time out of your busy week and this nice day to come in and talk to us and hear what we're doing on safety. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the physical side of uh, security that we installed. Um, first of all, as Dr. Wozniak said, uh, I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Safety 
facilities and transportation. So um, safety is obviously our top priority uh, in Frazier. It always has been and will continue to be a top priority for us. Um, my background, I'm actually an architect. Um, I've been in the business for over 20 years now. Uh, designed a whole bunch of different buildings, but specialized in schools in my past. Um, from there, I actually went to Bart Mellon and built schools for a long time. And then from there, came to Frazier after I built Frazier schools with uh, the time was Dr. Richards. Uh, came over here and uh, took on this role. So um, with that, uh, some of the updates we've, done, we've made. Um, we started our safety initiative back in 2005, actually. Um, when I was with Bart Mallow, uh, we installed a sally port. Everybody knows what that is, a secure entry, in all of our elementary buildings. So we've been on this journey for a long, long time. Um, we also installed what we call columbine locks. Everybody know what that is? A way to lock your door on the inside of a classroom instead of on the outside. So we installed that back in 05 too, that bond issue, in all of our teaching spaces across the district. Since then, we continue to build out our safety plan and it continues to evolve and we continue to um, add to it. So over the last um, couple of years, um, the Fraser Public Schools has invested just shy of $2 million in safety items in our building, actually physical items. We'll go through those here in a minute. Uh, we also partnered with a company called, um, they changed their name, but um, SEC, um, which is used to be secure education, now secure environment consultant because they do security for all sort of different environments. Um, they've assisted us with all of our online training that we do uh, for all of our staff. So it doesn't matter if you're a principal, teacher, hall monitor, cafeteria worker, custodian, administrator, it doesn't matter. Every year, in addition to the original training we gave them, in-person training, we have to do a two-hour training, which is mandatory, which puts this at everybody's forefront of their mind before every school year. Uh, we do that in September in our uh, professional development. We also practice our drills, which is a state requirement. Most of you probably know that. Um, and we've created PowerPoints and literature for our teachers, so after the drill, the teachers can sit down with their kids and explain to them why we did this. And a lot of that came from this that we'll talk about, which is our flip chart, okay? Uh, we are trying to be more realistic with our drills because we know in the time where, God forbid, it actually happens and it's a real event, um, when we have people that are doing things ahead of time, because we know we have a drill, right? So we close our blinds ahead of time, we lock our door ahead of time. That's not a real life situation, right? So we know if a kid, even in a fire drill, if we have a child that is um, sensitive to loud noises, flashing lights and all that, and that child is going to freeze during a fire drill, we have to know that. Because when a fire occurs, God forbid, and that kid freezes, someone's got to take that kid and get him out of the building. Right? So we try to make them more realistic. We continue to work on that um, as we do our drills. So it's more of an active scenario for us. So some of the things we did this year, this past summer, uh, for this school year, we implemented all this for the start of the school year in the fall. So I'll go through some emergency buttons that we put on um, all the walls, they're under principal's desk, and we'll go through that. But everything ties back to our training, which is all here, and you'll see that, okay? We always, everything we did ties back to what we were taught and what we were, how we, what we learned. So we had an emergency safety bags in every single classroom. Um, has the same stuff in it, or hang, hung in the same location, but it doesn't matter if you're at Fraser High School, Disney Elementary, Edison Elementary, if you go there, you look by the front door, there's a red safety bag in, in that room with the exact same stuff in it. Uh, we distributed additional two-way radios. Uh, those radios are tied to our um, district-wide uh, channel system we have, which runs through transportation. So if I'm at Fraser High School, my channel here is channel four. I can communicate among all the radios on channel four. If I'm at my building in the operations and maintenance building and there's an emergency here and I need to hear what's going on, I just turn my radio to channel four and I can communicate. So same thing, everybody's got their own channel. Doesn't matter what school it is. So we also have a security 
channel, which is channel two. If something does happen, we can go to channel two and we can communicate among ourselves. That radio will actually go all the way down to Detroit. So that's how far our signal travels. We can actually follow our buses down there and communicate with them as well. Uh, we added uh, exterior stickers on our glass outside, and we'll show you some pictures of that, what they look like. We changed some of our key symbol placards on the outside of the doors, the numbers, and I'll explain to you why we did that here shortly. Um, the district invested a significant amount of money to put a new PA system in every single building. And that PA system is state of the art. It allows us to grow with it. So that has a lot of capability that we continue, will continue to add to it. And we can talk a little bit about that as we get into some of the emergency buttons. We added exterior speakers at Richards Middle School. So if you're around the middle school and you hear the bells and you hear the announcements, we did that on purpose. Um, that was the only building that didn't have the speakers on the outside, so we added that. Uh, we did some additional door hardware upgrades. Um, we've since the original Columbine lock installation, we've converted some spaces into classrooms that we actually use for mediation or whatever. So we added that Columbine function to those classrooms. So every teaching space that we have now has that function that you can lock it from the inside. Uh, we also added some indicators. You can see on some panic bars, even these panic bars, when the door is locked from the inside, now you can see it actually physically says locked and unlocked. The teachers had some concern originally that when they locked it, they didn't know if they were unlocking or locking it. So we made sure that they knew that they locked it. So I'll show you some pictures of that. Uh, we did some window coverings um, on the inside of our, mainly the elementary buildings. A few here, one right next door, we did one. Uh, but we have kind of half glass and walls in the corridors, and those little ones did a great job of hiding. But if I got up close to the window, I could physically pick them out where they were. So what we did is we put a sticker on there, an opaque sticker that went up about three feet. So now you physically can't see where they're hiding to secure them more. Uh, we had the security roll down shades. So everybody had some sort of shade in their classroom, but it varied, right? Some people had paper, some people had homemade blinds, uh, curtains. So we created a district standard and put them on every window. That is a lockdown space. Um, so we'll show you a picture of that. Uh, we did security uh, film on many of our, actually all the classroom doors and side lights, got it, and all the offices. Um, so this is a six minute film. You can beat on this with a hammer, a wrench, whatever. It's not bulletproof, but it will stop you for six minutes when you're coming in, if you're trying to get in. So all of our best deals now have that. And then we also did some burglar alarm upgrades, which we had to do to work with our new security button system, which I'll show you. So these are the buttons that we installed. Again, remember they all tie back to this, right? So our first one, uh, we started from the most dangerous event to the least dangerous on the right. So the first button you come to in any building is the lockdown button. Now what that button does when you push that button, they're not only located, we'll just take Fraser High School as an example, we have them in the main office, we have them on the counseling office. We added them to the athletic league, we added it to the uh, CTE wing, so we have them on the north and south side of the building. All the assistant principals upstairs have these buttons, and we also added one to the concession stand on the uh, west side of the building. Okay. Now, in addition to these buttons, we also have buttons under all of our assistant secretaries or principals' desks as well that do the same thing. Those buttons are painted red as well, again, to follow the lockdown. So anything that has to do with the lockdown, is red in color. When you push that button, it does a series of things that we all have, we had to do independently before. So the first thing that does when you push the button is it engages our new PA system. And that PA system comes over, it makes an announcement, which is the principal's voice. So when the message comes over, it's a familiar voice. We didn't want a computer saying we're going into a lockdown. So for here, for instance, in the high school, it's Mr. Science. He comes out and says, an emergency, it's a lockdown, or whatever one of these we're doing, it says that's what the emergency is. So it automatically does that. Immediately, it dials Audio Center, who's our alarm company, and it tells them what button was pushed. So they know if it was Mr. Science's office, they know if it was who's ever office upstairs, and they can tell them that the emergency button in whatever place was pushed, and we need you there. They don't call the building. They're sending police. They know that's an act of violence. Police are on their way. After doing that, it automatically locks the outside door for us. We used to have to hit a lockdown button to do that. Now this button does everything for us. So all with one push. 
A lockout is a scenario where we have someone maybe down the road that Rob 7-Eleven is running around and the police feel that the school building is in danger. So they'll call the school and say, I need you guys to go in a lockout. And what that means for us is we hit that button. Now it's not gonna call audio sentry because the police already know about it, but it's going to automatically lock that outside door and it's gonna make the same announcement, but say we're in a lockout situation now, okay? And for us on the inside, it's normal business, but no one comes in or out. We, we hold school as we typically would inside. Evacuate is for anything such as like a gas leak or something where we had to evacuate. Back when I was in Barton Mallow, we had a gas leak. And we had to clear the high school to the stadium. So in an event like that, that's what we would use that. Again, same, same thing happens. That button gets pushed. A solemn announcement comes over to the PA, tells them this is what we're doing. Now we can also go on an all call and physically talk to them as well if we have to with that PA system. And then obviously shelter in place, which is for severe weather. We had something where we had to take cover, if that's what we would, we would use. The white button is our schedule validation button. That button is only used by my staff, and what that does is it, we push that every morning. That tells our card access system it's a normal day, so our key cards work. If we're on break, holiday break, spring break, we won't hit that button in the morning. That way, our doors will not automatically that lock. You can still get in, but it will not lock. Question, sorry to interrupt. Um, at what point or how do you determine if it's a lockout or a lockdown? So the police will contact us in a lockout situation. If it's a lockdown, we're creating the lockdown ourselves, telling the police we need help. If it's a lockout, the police are contacting us saying, hey, someone just robbed the bank. They're running around right now. We don't know where they're at, so we need you to lock down your building. When I say lockdown, lock out meaning no one in or out. Now it could be us, could be Edison, could be Disney, could be all of us, because they don't know where the person's at. So the situation that happened a few weeks back was a lockout. No, that was a lockdown. No, at Richards so Middle School. The school, they said it was a lockout. Well, we did lock. Oh, the high school. Oh, the high school, oh, the high school. yes, yes, okay. correct. The high school was a lockout. Two schools. Yes, the middle so, school was a lockdown because the proximity of the high school the police thought it would be a good idea if we put this building in a lockout, but didn't feel Edison, we had to worry about that, so they we went into a lot. We stayed normal over there. And just to jump in, the reason we didn't have to push the button is because the police knew what was going on at the middle school, and they wanted us to lock or keep all the kids in the building. And when they, you hit that lock down button, you need to be able to talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, if there was an active shooter, and you could get out of the building, you want to run and you know, to handle that. In this case here, the police wanted everyone to stay in the classrooms because we knew about that incident before first hour ended. So the children hadn't moved through the building, you know, other than when they came in. So we have been directed by the police to keep everyone in the classrooms. So that's why Mr. Julian went on the PA and said, we're in a lockdown, everyone is to stay in the, the classroom. And, and Carrie, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, I don't want to wait until the end. Do our students know the difference between the lockout and lockdown? And if so, how do they know that? Yeah, that's um, a good question. We are we have big fly decks for all of that, so we went over that at the beginning of the year. However, I really do believe that now that a lot of our students experience what happened a couple months in the last month, that um, they probably need a refresher. Because I don't think they may have paid quite as good of attention that slide. I don't think they realized that yeah. I think that the yeah. parents spoke yeah. yeah. I think that there was a lot of confusion between the two buildings yeah. and then into even the elementary because so many have devices. Right, right. right. And that's the problem. Things kind of that, that happens, you know. And the police were amazing. I mean, they were here so quickly that they really guided the process and said the high school should be in a you know a lot now. The other buildings you don't need to worry about, you know. Um and this building here they wanted everyone to be locked down and in their classrooms because that was helping with the investigation that they were doing. It was very important that everybody you know, stayed in their classrooms. In September, the teachers go over all the buttons and go over all of this. And I think um, what we've learned is that they need a refresher because some of them may not have been paying as close attention. Because we actually talked about um, the, the slide that we put together at each level is a little bit different. Because like K-1-2, we have a very different um, description.
description of what you're going to do when it's a lockdown. We don't want to obviously live down with children, so you want to have a different conversation with them. So we were real intentional about that, but again, that was back in September. So we've been talking about the importance of having the classroom teacher go back through um, that slide back so they know what's going on. And unfortunately, sometimes the kids just panic, and you can tell them over and over again, it's this or it's that. And you know, when something does happen, they're going to, you know, you, you just, you've got to do your best to help de-escalate them. And, you know, um, we, we had a, a student, you know, I, I know they tried to run out of the building, even though we said not, you know, you talk to them and you, you try to redirect. But that, it does happen, you know, and that's just because they're, they're anxious. And, and uh, for the staff members that are here, um, you hear me say all the time to get into this and read it and know it. Yeah. Because the day that something happens, it's too late to get into it and know it. So spend time looking through it, reading it, understanding it, knowing what you have to do so when something does happen, like at the middle school, it's second nature to you, right? And you need to tell the kids that. That's why we created that slide deck and allow time after a drill to go through that with the kids because it's important that the kids understand that as well. And as Dr. Wadsang said, if I have a group of preschoolers, my conversation is much different than when I'm in with a bunch of seniors, right? My options are different. I have a question back to it, referring to the button that wasn't pushed that day. Mm -hmm. How do you determine when you have to push it or yeah. you call the police in? I mean, at that point, we didn't know what was in the school. So how, why right. wouldn't you automatically right. go right the down and push actually, the police actually, yeah. We did know what was in the school. We the, did know the, police were, yeah. the, the police were here. Yeah, everybody was here with the plate. I happened to be in the building that day. Alex was here that day. Like, we were all literally here physically in the building. It was a very unique situation. He yeah. was in the building. I mean, it was a very unique situation a little bit different than that what? you normally would have expected, having all of those people here. The other important thing to remember is with what we, with what that situation was, they believe, and I you know, obviously would take the direction that people staying in their classrooms was really important. You know, we didn't want, because Dan will talk a little bit about this, you know, when you go into a lockdown, and if you do think it's an active shooter, if you can get out, you get out of the building. You know, but we didn't want anyone going anywhere because we didn't know that. So we felt everybody was safer staying in um, in their classroom. So that's why the PA system is very important because Mr. Julie was also able to make announcements um, throughout the experience to kind of let people know what we were looking for at and give updates. So the PA system was really important, yes. Just real quick, um, do you go through these drills with students? I know the staff has, but like my district she's Alice training. Do the students walk through these things so that they know? I, not, I, I, most of the kids, you probably seem to I understand that they don't necessarily listen, but when they actually do it, and they're walking through and you have scenarios and you can talk to them and explain what they yeah. to them. Does the district do that currently or is there a plan to do that in the future? We do that. Yeah, we do that. So when we go into like, we'll do a lockdown during lunch and then you debrief. But I'm talking about after the shooter situation. We talk about, well, it depends on the level. We don't do it in the lower grades. We're not going to talk about that. According to my son, in the middle school, that had never happened. So I'm just questioning that. What do you mean? What what does it happen? I'm talking about like an Alice where you're talking to students no. or like we don't pretend someone's coming in and shooting. So I, I I'm not I'm not suggesting that there's different ways that you can yeah. do scenarios, obviously. But when kids it's very I'm an educator. It's very difficult the first time you do it because mm -hmm. it's uncomfortable. But when you start doing it and you have these conversations with kids and you say there's you know, and you, it, it's very, it's not on the PA, it's not, we have this conversation with your class, if there was somebody in this hallway, and we are here, what should we do? Well, we're going to get out. So, I have these conversations with my own son, sure. and during the lockdown at RMS, he kept saying to me, Mom, we didn't know what was going on, and we're locked down under our desk, and all I kept thinking was that this was a real situation that I should probably get out of here. So I think having the kids walk through those trainings is very important um, so that they are comfortable having kids comfortable. And in your situation, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, I apologize. Okay. I want to know, you know, again, who the teacher was, you know, what happened in that particular classroom. Um, because what we learned from that experience is some teachers may have handled these a little bit differently. And that's okay. And I, 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 I would like to say publicly overall, I mean, I was, 
I'm extremely pleased with how it's handled. I know those situations, yeah. you never know what's going to happen. Right. I'm not here to minimize. No, no. I, 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 learned I love the staff. I, love, I, I think it was awesome how it was handled in, in that way. My point is, is just, I think letting kids have those scenarios so that you can talk through it give them a better, so that they're not so panicked when it's done yet. So we'll talk a little bit later, but the district chose SEC for a reason. Uh, Alice training and Ron High fight is a little bit different philosophy than what we yeah. use in Fraser schools. And I'll go through that with you. Um, we can talk about what our experience is and what we were told from our safety partner. Um, this S is for secure, that's first for a reason, because we believe that's the safest. And statistically, it is. Now there's some, now there's some scenarios that absolutely you should you should get out. We can we can talk about those as we get a little further, but we'll dive in a little bit okay. further. Okay. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. So I guess this is still like the staff, but I guess everyone too. So when these buttons are pressed, do you have like a suggestion on how to differentiate what is what? Because like today we have like a 28 of them. It sounds the exact saying like that siren at the beginning and like getting our attention like five to ten seconds I'm standing here because I don't know what the situation is. Like, yep. Is there a way that we can differentiate that maybe? So Dr. Wozniak and I talked about that. Um, we originally put that siren up front for any emergency so it would catch your attention, right? In some of our spaces, um, the announcements could be difficult to hear. For example, gyms, cafeterias, band rooms, both music rooms, those kind of spaces, um, it may be difficult. So we wanted something to grab your attention. Um, we're gonna address that concern during our current bond. We're gonna put new speakers in throughout the district and those spaces we'll use a horn style so you can hear better. With that being said, uh, we talked to our safety consultant and uh, we're looking at taking that siren away from every drill except for lockdown so it'll just be an announcement as a you know we continue to learn as a district right when these things happen who would ever think what happened today would happen right but it did so now how can we try to fix that the best we can with keeping the original scheme and design that we had still intact so um, we're planning on talking about that tomorrow but we'll we'll figure out how to do this that's something we think we should do but that is a possibility and Jason, who's the owner of SEC, said that would be a very logical um, solution to that problem by doing that. So we're comfortable with his backing to do something like that. So that's probably where we're at. I think that would be very good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so just a couple few pictures here. Uh, these are the safety bags we put in. Obviously, you see it says our school logo. It says safety bag. We put some, just a real small safe for safe kit in there. Nothing, there is no drugs that kids could give. It's all Band-Aids, gauze, that kind of stuff. Uh, we worked with Marty, anybody knows Mrs. Van I. Uh, her kids did an excellent job and helped us add some additional supplies to these bags, so those are all installed now as well, so we're very thankful for that. Um, our flip chart is in there in every single classroom. Um, we have a red emergency folder, and in that folder should be a class roster in there, so if we have to leave, we can actually take attendance, we know who's in our class. And then any, not real sensitive, because we don't want to um, put every, safety concern out there was do we want it to be somewhat private. So but if there's any safety concerns as far as medical issues, uh, we need to know that. Uh, we had a few at Richards Middle School that uh, Mr. Ray was dealing with. You know, we have some kids that had some, some um, medical issues that we had to attend to during that uh, lockdown that we were in. So Mr. Ray did a great job of handling that, that situation for us. Uh, these are the radios, um, just as, so many schools had radios prior to this. Um, some of them were tied to our, our uh, two-way system, some were not. The district provided every elementary school an additional 10 program radios to their building. And we laid out per SEC how we wanted those distributed uh, in their building. Uh, Administration building received five of them, so Dr. Waziak now has a radio, so in an emergency we can get to where we need to go. But everybody in the admin building has a radio. Uh, we took five to RMS because they already had several of them, but they needed five more. Uh, and then again, they were all programmed. You see the channels on the sticker there. Every radio we had, even if it was existing, we went back and put stickers on the back of them. So that way they all look like that, and you know what channel you got to go to in an emergency. 
Um, these are a picture of the stickers. Uh, basically, it tells everybody if you have a delivery, you got to call. That's my building. You got to call that number, which is my direct number, to my office, so we can, um, you know, get that delivery. Meet you out there. Same around every door here in the high school says call the main office, and we'll direct you from there. And then on the inside, it basically says do not open this door for anybody, because as kids or as parents, we teach our kids to be polite, right? That's what we used to do. You open the door for people. We can't do that anymore. We got to make sure everybody stays outside. So it tells them, do not open the door for anybody. Friend, not friend. You know them, don't know them, don't open them. Uh, these are our outside door numbers, and we actually learned this uh, through SEC. Um, our last facility audit, which was our fourth one that we had in the district, um, they've done two of them for us now. But the gentleman that came out and did it happened to be the liaison officer during the Oxford school shooting. So, um, Talking, his name is Jason as well. Talking to Jason, uh, he was unfortunately not at that building that when that event occurred. He was at another building. Uh, he came racing back, and because he was an officer there in the building, he knew what door had card access. So actually, where Ethan was at the time, that door did not have card access. So he had to fly by that door to the next door, um, almost hit the building he said, and went in that door and then worked his way back to where Ethan was um, and took care of the situation. But the reason we did this, he said it would be a lot easier if we had door numbers that were different colored. So all of our card access doors now have a yellow number on them. All the other doors are blue, royal blue like they were before, prior. But now the police know that every door that has the yellow symbol has our card access. And they can get in at any time. We'll go a little bit more into that. But. The couple pictures of our indicators that we added over the summer. Now it says lock on lock. Like I said, panic bar on the left and a standard door on the right. Uh, this is a uh, just a mock-up of what we did over at uh, all of our elementaries that had glass, so that's opaque. The bulldog. This is Emerson, obviously. The bulldog logo is in the corridor, and then we did a clouds uh, picture of clouds on the inside, so you weren't looking you just at a white sticker or blue. At least it's. I don't know if you want to kind of explain the elementary here over Yeah, so the, the walls are about yay high and it was glass all the way up. So now, like I said, we added three feet to it so you physically can't see. I'm, I'm guessing you guys probably got it in your school, right? The stickers? Is it, is it outside of the no, these are inside the <clears throat> So well, we could see. Some of the we could. Yeah. yeah, I did. I could see it. Like I said, they did a great job at hiding. If you got up really close okay. and you look, you can pick them out. So now you physically can't even see in there. Uh, these, this is a picture of our security shades that we put in every piece of uh, glass. Every door has this. Now you simply just pull it, um, and the thing rolls down. It's weighted at the bottom, and it's on our doors and the lights next to it. Uh, so it's standard across the district. Uh, this is a picture of the security film. Like I said, you could beat on that for six minutes, and you will not get through it. And in the end, we're trying to buy time, right? So the police can get here. That's what we're trying to do. And Fraser police are here within two minutes. This is a picture of our alarm uh, system that we upgraded to. Again, that works uh, with our, uh, our security buttons. And we'll talk a little bit real quick about how we've prepared our buildings and our staff as far as our training. Uh, so, some key points I think are important to remember, and not just our school district, but a lot of school districts, right? We do a great job at keeping our building safe from outsiders that want to come in the building. The difficult part is trying to keep you safe against our own people, right, that get in. That's where it becomes very difficult. Um, we had a very, very long talk about metal detectors with Jason, because after that uh, Oxford shooting, of course, that came up, um, and this is, this is Jason's answer to that, and I, I agree with him. Whenever something happens, right, naturally we want to put something physical in to solve that problem. That's very difficult to do in a building like this. Here's why it's difficult. Number one, it's very expensive, right? Buying the, the, the metal detectors are one thing. Think about every single door we have around this building, right? We have 100 doors around here because we designed school buildings for fire, right? Fire for exit. So you've got to have these doors in order to build buildings this big. Or you couldn't do it. So we have a lot of exit doors. 
So number two, you have to put these devices at every single door. At Fraser High School right now, we have three points of entry in the, in the morning, all day long. You have the fine doors, you have the bus doors, you have the main entry. That's great, right? So we could do three of them. But the problem is, is if I'm a friend or I have somebody that's in cahoots with me, all I gotta do is go prop a door open without a metal detector come in, right? Or it's just gonna move to somewhere else. It's gonna move to the parking lot. You're not gonna stop them. If they have the intent to do real well, they're gonna do real well. It just doesn't matter where it is, right? So what SEC says, and they teach us, is you're much better off investing into your staff and teaching them what to do. Teaching them to recognize things, be prevented, right, before it actually happens. So we've done work very hard at doing that. Uh, on top of not only buying the metal detectors, you have to have the staff to operate them, right? So there has to be someone at every detector. You have the maintenance of those machines because they're going to break. So it's a very, very expensive model. Um, so we've been very proactive, as I said, about all of our uh, building occupant safety. That's our, one of our number one priorities. Everybody that comes in this building, we want to be safe. And we do everything we can to, to ensure that we make you as safe as you possibly can be. Uh, we communicate with all of our stakeholders. Um, you know, we, we work as a team. We reflect on what we do as we, we've talked already. We debrief on all of our issues many times. The middle school incident, we talked. We had four meetings after probably to make sure we were thinking everything through. Yeah, this and I think that's a great point because we learned a lot of right. it with that particular incident. You know, the phones and the, the parents coming media, to the front door. We learned a lot about. You, you can tell kids to put their phone away or, you know, whatever it might be, but that, that's just not realistic. So, you know, how do we help kids, you know, be de escalated? You know, and in that situation, we knew the kids were safe in those rooms. So, you know, it, it, it was pretty, they were going to text, you know, the enemy, whether we wanted them to or not. Correct. So, you know, how do we help teachers navigate those conversations? That's something we talked a lot about. Do we say, you know, Mr. Julian was giving them the PA points, and do you say, hey, then have the phone for a few minutes? Uh, because that was really, I mean, for all those middle school kids, uh, that was a hard situation to try to keep their, their phones at, you know, in their hands. So that's something we've been talking about. But again, it's about having the conversation after. Mr. Julian um, also um, surveyed staff, yeah, yeah. met with Dan, and talked. That was one of the things that came up. So yeah. I think being really reflective after all of the drills is really important. 